Hey, there's energy in the room today. Glad you're here. Hey, we're, we're continuing our study in Matthew. As you know, Matthew is the apostle to the, to the Jews, and Jesus is being presented to the nation of Israel as the Messiah, and eventually they will reject the Messiah in Matthew chapter 12, but he's, at, he's, he's offering the kingdom to them, and we're learning a lot of things on how to live out our lives through the things he's teaching his disciples. Now, this week, with God, all things are possible. Now, that's kind of like a requisite for Christianity. I mean, we're living in a world where we don't see a lot of the impossible, at least we think in overtly, but folks, the impossible can happen. It can happen to you at any time. So always have hope. So if you would, stand for reading of the Word of God, Matthew 9, verses 18 through 31. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And suddenly a woman, who had a flow of blood for twelve years, came from behind and touched the hem of, her, of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, Make room, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose, and the report of the of this went out into all the land. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to him, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. This is the Word of God. God. Father, we thank you for this time. As always, we are grateful to be able to sit down and study the inerrant, infallible Word of the living God. You have given us your Word as a template for life. Jesus lived a perfect life to model for us the life that you would like us to live. We can't be perfect here, Lord. We know that. But we're endeavoring to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. May that happen today, Holy Spirit. Teach us the things that you want us to hear from this lesson. We all come in here with individual situations, individual problems, individual issues that you will touch somehow, some way during this talk. Each one of us will hear something special for that individual. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. The theme of Matthew is Jesus is the promised king. Hopefully you'll never, ever forget that. There's going to be about 70,000 lessons here on Matthew, and you'll know that Jesus is the promised king is a theme. Now, last week we talked about true disciples of Christ will be criticized. This is like a guarantee. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're a true follower of Christ, you can expect to be criticized in this culture today. And we learned something. True disciples will will, will be criticized But true disciples are called to stand for Christ, to impact their world, to be salty, to be salty. And I have a, this I did not practice. Oh, look at that. It's working. Okay. Anyway, we have a little thing here, salt of the earth. Now, salt of the earth, we are all called to be people who inhibit the growth of sin and darkness in the world. Look at you are salt. Wherever your feet touch, you're inhibiting growth of of sin. You are impacting the world that is around you. That's an important point to to remember. Salt fertilizes, salt stings, salt inhibits growth. But most importantly, salt impacts. We are all to impact the world that we've been placed in. Now, why does the world criticize true disciples? Well, it's for this reason. They want to intimidate you. They want you to adopt their, their values, to lose your focus. They want you to become just like them, to have a worldview that is a non-biblical worldview. So when you're criticized, do not lose focus. Stay salty. Stay salty. Stay in contact. Don't give up. 
And I would suggest this to you, church. It's time for the true church. It's time for the true church, the truth within the church. Oz Guinness wrote a book, Time for Truth. And in that book, he has the Beijing uprising, the revolution in 1987 or so, when Tank Man stood before these tanks and stopped the Republic of China in its tracks. They didn't know what to do with this guy. Living free in a world of lies, hype, and spin. We've talked about this guy before. He got tired of what he was seeing. He went to the grocery store. These are actually groceries here. And he couldn't stand it anymore being on the sidelines. And he just bursted in and he stopped this column of tanks. No one knows what happened to Tank Man. But to this day, we remember Tank Man for what, he had, what he's done. So, only those, listen to this, only those who live out their biblical truth, live out the truth, can truly be free. Otherwise, you're going to be in bondage to what the world tells you is, is the norm. It, indoctrination over and over. Remember, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. A must-know, a must-know for you true Christians, you remnant Christians, those few who are salty, those few who will stand for our Lord, you will have the Lord's attention. You will have the Lord's attention. Remember Stephen in Acts chapter 7. He's drugged before the council because he's speaking about the name of Jesus. And he's drugged before the council and he gives the history of Israel in his talk. And the, it just lands on deaf ears. They just won't hear him, just won't hear him. And finally, out of frustration, Stephen says these words, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Now, do you think that made those folks in the council happy and cheery? No way. This is how they responded in 754. When they heard these things that Stephen was saying, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed their teeth at him. And when they, when they did that, Stephen knew his time was up. And Stephen saw heaven open and Jesus standing at the right hand of Father. Stephen had the attention of heaven. Stephen had the attention of Jesus Christ. Stephen was criticized. Stephen was even called to die. Yes, today there are a few, a few that will be called to die for their faith. Now, it hasn't happened here yet, but it's happened throughout the world. We've talked about that many times. And Jesus took notice. And I want to suggest to you, when you are being criticized for your faith, generally it's going to happen out in the world someplace, in the workplace. It even happens in homes, okay? Because uh, Jesus actually comes to separate, even within homes, husbands and wives, uh, uh, daughters and and dads, and children, and all that stuff. There's a separation. You remember the verse, okay? Uh, there's a separation. But anyway, when you are called to be criticized for your faith, consider that an extreme honor. An extreme honor. I would even say heroic, because you're going against the grain. You're going against a tidal wave that is coming at you that wants you to believe a non-biblical worldview. So, Live a life of value, folks. We have one shot at this. We're going through this one time. We're not reincarnated over and over, as it says in Hinduism, and hope you, hope you get it right one day. No, this is it. This is our time. One shot. Give it your best effort. Stay focused on your mission. What was Jesus' mission? I have come to do the Father's will. What is your mission? I have come to do the Father's will. That's correct. So when you experience criticism for your faith, rejoice. You're in great company. It is an honor to do that. So this week, something that we all have to keep our minds fixed on, particularly as we see the changes in our culture, with God all things are possible. Now you might have to say that over and over and over, but man, you got to get to the point where you really believe this. With God all things are possible. And the question that I want to ask you to just do some introspection, do you believe this? Do you? It's easy in this group to say, yes, I believe it. But when you're out there in the world, there could be some questions that come in. So it goes something like this. Sometimes it seems that God is asleep. Have you ever experienced that? Where is God in this? That he doesn't care, that he doesn't notice me. 
But I can assure you that God is awake. I want to indelibly imprint this on, on our minds. Have courage for the great sorrows of life, and folks, they come, and patience for the small ones. And when you have laboriously accomplished your daily task, go to sleep, and please always know God is awake. God cares. God is aware of your situation. God knows exactly where you are and what you're going through. He is a God that cares for you. We must process that, must process that. So, in verse 18 and 19, we're going to have a raising of Jairus' daughter. And a lot of folks say, impossible. Impossible. This can't happen. It's impossible. Well, let's read the text. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler, that would be Jairus, we know that in Mark and Luke, came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And I'll bet you those disciples are saying, wow, let's see what Jesus is going to do now. He's going to go raise the dead. Yes, raise the dead. Impossible. Now, we know in Mark and in Luke, it says the child was dying. Matthew says the child is dead. But any, whatever the situation it is, it is critical and it is desperate enough for the synagogue ruler to risk being criticized and go see Jesus. See, Jesus isn't popular in the, in, in the synagogue. He's looked down on. But this leader in the synagogue says, I don't care. I'm desperate. I'm going to go seek Jesus. So Jairus had a need, and Jairus came to Jesus. And it did not matter the criticism. And I want you to notice how he came to Jesus. He came to Jesus worshiping Jesus. Folks, that's the right way to approach Jesus. It isn't the right way to approach Jesus and going, Jesus, why aren't you doing what I want you to do? That's not going to get you any place, okay? He came with the right attitude. So worship means to pay honor, to bow prostrate or lie prostrate before our Lord, to bow down. Now, you need to know this. All humanity, everything in God's creation will at one time in the future bow before him. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11 at the name of Jesus. What a name. There's no other name like our Lord Jesus. Every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. That's the totality of creation. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, you know what Lord is. I've said it many times, but you get to see a picture of it now. So Lord is kurios. And that was like perfect, Ritza. That was perfect timing, yes. Great, thank you. Lord, kurios, kurios, meaning power, master, owner, ruler. When you see Lord, and you, you, we so casually say, well, the Lord. Oh, no, master, ruler, owner, all authority in my life. You are the Lord Jesus Christ. That is who you are. And we bow before you. Now, worship also means this. It also means to serve, to serve. So it means affection, honor, and service. Romans 12, 1, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to the Lord, which is your spiritual act of worship. Spiritual act of worship or service or service. The King James says worship. Everything else says service. So worship can also mean service. Service. Now, Jesus received the worship from this synagogue leader. Only God is to be worshipped. Only God is to be worshipped. This is a very important point that I'll emphasize more and more as we go through this talk. Jesus in the wilderness tempted three times. The last temptation, Satan offered the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus said something very specific to him. Get ye behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, Satan, and him only shall you serve. See, worship is service. You serve, Satan. That's what I, and that's, what did, Je, what did Jesus do? He took something from Deuteronomy, he took the sword of the Spirit out, and he stabbed Satan right in the eyeball. Boom. You ever get hit in the eye? It hurts. It hurts. When, my, when Scott was about five years old, we're wrestling, and he took his little knuckle, he took his fist about the size of my knuckle, 
and he went bam and got me right in the eye. I was totally incapacitated. I'm crying out, Chris, Chris, save me from this. Yeah. It hurt. That's my wife, Chris. I mean, she came, what did, what did, what did Scott do? Yeah, okay. But anyway, he took out his sword. Yeah, peep, now, hear this. People worship and serve their idol, their little gods. We are experts at that as people. Now, they're flesh gods, and we know what the flesh idols are. Food, drink, drugs, appearance, money, status, children, even your work, even your hobbies, anything that you put about God, that is what you're worshiping, that is what you are serving. Keep that in mind. Secondly, you can worship our emotions, our emotions, fear, anxiety, worry, rage, that sort of thing. People can be consumed with their emotions and their feelings. Worship is service, folks. Whatever you make an idol of, you are worshiping. You are making it into a God. The second commandment says this, do not make for yourself an idol. It's not the second suggestion. It's the second commandment. Do not make for yourself an idol. Anything that you put above your Lord. Nothing. Nothing. Look at when people came into contact with angels, what did they do? They fall flat on their face. And what did the angel say? Quick, quick, stand up, quick. You're not supposed to worship me. He's quick. Yeah. We do not worship angels or anything. We worship our Lord. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to think about this. Whatever you're worshiping can become an idol stronghold. Can become an idol stronghold. What are strongholds? I have a picture here. Again, this author had his list of stuff. You can add your own stuff. Drunkenness, drugs, unforgiveness, anger, anxiety, lying, laziness. That's kind of an interesting one. Laziness has really captured our culture today. And people just don't want to work. Strongholds, arrogance, sexual sin, pride, and you get the rest of the list. Even religion can become an idol. Don't put anything above your Lord. Nothing above him. Now, I want to define what a stronghold is. So you know, because these things we fight against in our lives. What are strongholds? The definition is this. A fortified military stronghold, a strong-walled fortress, something that is heavenly fortified. Now, another description, a number two definition is this. It's a false argument in which a person seeks shelter, a hiding place to escape reality. Isn't that something? So where do people go? Drugs, alcohol, sex, hobbies, work. You can invest in your kids. You can invest in so many different things and forget God. Forget God. So how do we deal with strongholds? How do we deal with strongholds? I want you to, I want you to think about something. There's going to be a picture that comes up here. And it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. But this picture here is this nasty look. Well, I guess I should use my pointer since I'm used to this nasty-looking demonic figure, strongholds, and you're down here as the warrior, okay? Casting down strongholds. Looks like a lot of opposition here. Looks like impossible to overcome. Oh, no. Oh, no. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 are going to tell us exactly how to do with this. Watch what, he's, what the Apostle Paul says. You've heard this verse many times, so hopefully it'll mean something greater for you today. For though we walk in the flesh, we're walking in this world in our natural body. For the weapons of our warfare with the demonic realm, warfare, are not carnal but mighty in God. For what? For pulling down strongholds. For pulling down fortresses. For pulling down long-held ways that we respond and react casting down arguments. The word is logismos, and it means thoughts, arguments, philosophies of this world, and every high, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought, every thought into captivity. Folks, if we bring every thought into captivity, those strongholds, this dude will become crashing down. You can have victory in any area. Casting down strongholds. 
Now, what we want to do as the people of God is to transfer the strongholds that have been in our life to God. Now, how do we do that? Well, we make God our number one priority. So make God your stronghold. And when you, are, when you make him your stronghold, remember this, you are free to choose your stronghold. Psalm 18, 1 through 3 says this, a great memory verse. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. It's where I hide. He is my shield. He is the horn of my salvation, and he is my stronghold. Stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Make God your stronghold. You do that by making him your number one priority. Let the walls fall down, folks, and these other strongholds that might have held you captive. We don't have to live with them. Cast them down. Now, the synagogue ruler is moved by a crisis. He wants Jesus to do the impossible. He comes to Jesus. so interesting. The synagogue didn't like Jesus, but this guy's coming to Jesus because he's heard about Jesus doing these great things to do the impossible, and he's willing to face the criticism, to lose position within his community. This didn't matter because he had a crisis. Then Jesus agrees to go, but then he's interrupted by another need. This woman with this 12-year issue of blood in verses 20 and 22. Now, can you imagine how this guy felt? Jesus is getting ready to go. He's going through the crowd, and now he's stopped by someone. And I imagine this guy feels like, hold it, Jesus. This is a crisis. Nothing in round, around here is as is important as getting to my daughter and getting healed. Okay, so he's got to deal with some emotions there. But in verse 20 and 22, we're going to see another impossible 12 years of an issue of blood. And suddenly, as he's walking through the crowd, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years. Now, that doesn't mean much to us. But if you have a flow of blood, you are declared unclean in that culture. Came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. And then these great words, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Jesus has a mission to go to this daughter that's dying, and then there's a course change. There's a course change. The religious leader is put on hold for just a few minutes. In the midst of the chaos, Jesus feels someone touch the hem of his garment. If only I may touch the garment, I shall be made well. Mark says this, knowing in himself the power had gone out of him, the dunamis power had gone out of him. Jesus will address this when he, when, he, when, he, when he felt the power go out of him. So before I get there, what is so important about the hem of the garment? What is so important about that? Well, the, the garment is called a tallit. It's a Jewish prayer shawl that Jesus wore. And on it were fringes were attached to the four corners. And this is a picture of a Jewish tallit. These are the, the tassels. These are the fringes. This is what she grabbed hold of. This is what Jesus sensed. Jesus couldn't feel this. There wasn't some great big tug and it's pulling the sh prayer shawl off. She touches this and somehow the power of Jesus is, is, is released to result in her healing. So you have this prayer shawl. And then she, then if only, and then she, maybe she says, if only I can touch this garment, I will be made well. Talk about faith. She can't talk to him. She's too embarrassed to talk to him face to face. Maybe she doesn't think he'll take time. So she just leans out and she reaches out and she grabs hold of this thing. I mean, I love this. You can see the desperation here. Jesus, all these people around. And she just reaches out by faith and says, if I only touch it, he doesn't even have to know I touch him. If I just touch it, he will heal me. That's what this lady believed. It's an incredible, incredible work of faith. Now think about her life. Twelve years, an issue of blood impossible, an impossible situation, many would say. And what we would say and what we're learning as Christians, with God, all things are 
possible. There will be a picture up here. With God, all things are possible. Twelve years of being considered unclean. Hemorrhage was considered unclean. I don't know what the hemorrhage is. People have all kinds of speculations. That's irrelevant. It is that she was considered unclean Levitically by the, in the culture. No one could touch her. She couldn't touch anybody else. She was cut off from society, unable to worship, 12 years. Embarrassed about her condition, feeling unworthy, 12 years. I can't possibly speak with him, but if I can just touch the tassel, I know he can heal me. I know he can. And watch what Jesus, what Jesus says. Now, remember, Jesus is just walking through the crowd. People are bumping into him all over the place. But she senses this power going out, this power going out. And then Jesus says some amazing words, the same thing he says to the paralytic. Be of good cheer. I mean, if Jesus says that to you, that's like a hip, hip, hooray moment. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Now hear this. With the paralytic, it was his friend's faith. With the woman, it was her faith. In both cases, faith was an important part of their healing. Believe and be healed. Believe and be healed. So, slight delay, slight delay. Jairus might be a little bit upset because of the delay. What can I learn from a delay? Or even a slight delay. God works, folks, on his timetable. Now, you've said prayers before, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, and you wonder, what are you doing, God? I mean, like I have like a 911 here, and you're going like, like it's nothing. I have a real issue here. Please intervene. God does, works on his timetable. He is aware even when we think he's not aware. And remember this, God who holds the universe together, Okay. I mean, the, the planets are moving at literally hundreds of thousands of miles an hour. Everything in space is moving, and Jesus says, Jesus is told, we're told in Colossians chapter 1, that Jesus holds it all together. He, everything is coordinated. Everything is organized. He who created the macro creation, the vastness of space, down to the micro creation, and the intricacies of the cell, and DNA, and that sort of thing. This God knows exactly where you are. Nothing's taking him by surprise. He knows your situation. Now, when my needs are not immediately met, now look, we're the microwave generation, okay? We want things now. And even the microwaves, like, I can't believe 30 seconds. I mean, it's so long. When's it going to be done? Yeah. When, we, when our needs are not immediately met, it is not time to go into panic mode. It's time to go into faith mode, transition to faith. There's lots of times when I don't understand, and you don't either. There's lots of, lots of times when I don't like the way things are unfolding. I'm very uncomfortable with it, very uncomfortable with it. But this is a time when I must tell myself, I will trust in the Lord until I die. I will believe him. I'll believe him. Now watch what happens next. He's going to run into, he's going to run into this house of chaos. He's going to raise the dead. Another impossible situation, some would say, verse 23 through 26. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room. He's got to wade through all this stuff. For the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And this is the response. They ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, get the unbelievers outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose, and the report of this went out into all the land. You bet. You bet. She's dead. Now she's alive. That's going to that's gonna proliferate within the community throughout all the land. So Jesus enters into a death situation, an impossible situation. And again, the scene is chaos. And I don't know if you know what the East is like, the Middle East in particular, but they are very emotional. When you are on TV and you see some of the Islamic ladies going down, thing, that's, that's part of that whole wailing, grieving thing that they do. So you have flute players, you have professional wailers that are hired to wail, okay? You have tears galore, you have grief all over the place, and then Jesus enters into this chaos. And he says these words, make room. 
Then the impossible words, the girl is not dead but sleeping. Now notice the response. I've already elaborated on it a little bit. The professional whalers and the flute players take a pause, and they, they, they ridiculed him. You know what it means? They criticized him, and if you have a King James, it says they laughed at him, degraded him, degraded him. Watch what Jesus does. Contrary to the fake faith healers that you see today on TV, he gets everybody out of the way, and he does this privately, privately. The crowd was put outside. Again, get rid of the unbelievers. Jesus took her by the hand, and the girl arose. The impossible became the possible by faith, by faith. Never think that God can't enter into your situation, the impossible situation that you're living in. Miracles are possible. Now, notice I say miracles are possible. Miracles are not regulars. Okay, we're not getting miracles every three seconds. We need to realize that. What did Jesus do? He did seven signs in the book of John. He turned water into wine healed a nobleman's son, healed a paralytic, fed the 5,000. Peter walked on water. He walked on water. Heals a blind man and raises Lazarus from the dead. Those are miracles. Jesus entered into the chaos and did miracles. But folks, miracles are not regulars. They are not regulars. We can believe and expect and, and trust God. That is our job. But miracles come in every now and then. The miracle, I think, is that God somehow puts in us the ability to trust him through the unanswered stuff that comes into our life. More on that in just a second. I want you to think about something. Think about your salvation. Now, I've mentioned this before. I think that's the greatest miracle of all. You're dead in your trespasses and sins, and the second you believe and say, yes, Jesus, you are alive, forever transferred kingdoms, Satan's kingdom, the Jesus kingdom, transferred destiny, hell to heaven, a, a whole different future forever with Jesus, forever with Jesus. Nothing is impossible with him. Now, we're going to progress here to two blind men, the two blind men, another impossible situation. Now, Jesus is an expert at healing the blind. Watch what he does here in verses 27 through 31. When Jesus departed from there, so he's traveling again, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, most people believe this is Peter's house. They're still in Capernaum. The blind men came to him, and Jesus said to him, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Yes, Kurios. Yes, master, ruler, owner. Then he touched their eyes, the caring touch of Jesus, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, see that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. They blabbed. Why did they blab? More in a second. Okay. So what we have seen thus far, we've seen a desperate father for a dead daughter. We've seen a desperate woman, 12 years unclean, and now we see a two desperate blind men. Two desperate blind All the situations are desperate. Look, at each one of us has situations that were desperate. That's what I'm trying to point out. And you don't know when Jesus is going to enter into your desperation. You don't know. You have to believe that he will. At the time of Jesus, the blind were relegated to being beggars. But yet they believed, and don't miss this, what he said, that what they said, Son of David, have mercy on us. Most people don't know Son of David is a messianic title. They are acknowledging Jesus as being the Messiah who would come in Isaiah 35, 4, would heal the blind eyes, open the ears, heal the lame, heal the lepers. When they came into the house, another private healing Jesus asked them a pointed question, an important question. Do you believe that I am able to do this? Our responsibility 
is to believe that he can. And their response was a resounding, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And then Jesus, in such a warm way, he touches their eyes. He touches them. And then he says, according to your faith, let it be. Again, faith was needed for the miracle to occur. Faith moves the heart of God. Let me say that again. Faith moves the heart of God. Our responsibility is to believe. Hebrews 11.1, 1, you know the definition. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. The attitude of I believe God no matter what is important. It moves the heart of God somehow. It moves him. I don't care what something looks like, sounds like, smells like. I'm going to trust God through this no matter what. That's what I'm going to do. Now, regarding faith, I want you to think about a couple things. The way people look at faith. Some people doubt, impossible, can't happen. If you have that attitude, you're not in, you're not in miracle country yet. You want to be able to believe. Some, secondly, some people think Jesus doesn't care about me. So I'm not even going to ask him. He doesn't care about me. Some could care less about Jesus. They even laugh at him, ridicule him. But there are a few who b- believe. And some will receive a healing, some will not. It's up to God. Again, faith moves the heart of God. Faith moves the heart of God. Your works isn't going to do it. Your money won't do it. Your promises. Oh, I, if you do this for me, Lord, I swear I'll do that for you. No, the promises aren't going to do it. Position won't do it. Faith, your belief that God can put you into miracle country. Now, our job that we're taught in Scripture is no doubting. No doubting. Hear what James says on this. There'll be a slide that comes up on this. But I want you to know the setting for this. James is talking about trials. And those trials come to you in, the, in various forms. Pokleos is the word that is used in James chapter 1. Like polka dots. Polka dots. Various sizes, various shapes, different, different times, types of trials. And then he talks about the testing of your faith and having the wisdom to go through the faith test. That is the context. Now watch what James says. But when you ask in the faith test, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed about by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. So, what is your job in any situation that you're dealing with is to have faith. Let's try that again. What is our job, well, not your job, our job in any situation that seems impossible is that we are to have faith. There we go. That was very good. Yes, faith, faith. Ask in faith. No doubting, no vacillating. No back and forth thinking. That is what that is. No, oh, I believe God can do it. Oh, he really can't do it. Oh, I believe, I, I believe oh, I think I, I think I made a mistake on this. No, no doubting, no doubting. And then and this, no double-minded thinking. You know what that means? No thinking that's divided between God and the world. Between God and the world's philosophies. The world philosophies say, no way, no way, no way. And we say, yes, 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 we believe God, not double-minded. And then listen to this one, and it'll come up on the screen. It is not about our profession of faith, saying I have faith, but truly believing by faith. There's a big difference there. God knows the difference. Speaking is one thing, believing is another thing. And now this question, is faith a ticket to getting whatever I want? The answer is a resounding no. No. In the end, it must always be thy will be done, not my will be done. Jesus taught us this, okay? Sometimes it's not God's will to heal you here, but you will be healed completely soon. Now, that's good news. That's good news. I'm closer than most of you guys to getting my complete healing. That's right. 
But I want you to hear this. I think this is probably the most important part of this lesson. God will give you the strength to endure, the courage to stand, the mental peace to persevere. Now, to me, that's God of the impossible. When that happens in my being, that I can have the peace, the courage, and the strength to stand through it, even though I'm still experiencing the thing, that's a miracle to me, that God has entered my situation. Why God chooses to heal some and others, I do not know. God's ways are his ways, but I know that Father does know best. Now, back to the blind men. Now, Jesus gives them one prohibition. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden, one prohibition. Don't eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. These, these two guys don't tell anybody. They didn't, have, they didn't pause one second. They just went out and he just blabbed all over the place. Blabbed all over the place. Why would Jesus not want them to go and blab? For this reason. After Jesus heals them, they're going to see clearly they go out and tell everybody, Jesus' purpose was to preach, for this purpose I have come, Mark 1.38. Spiritual change was much more significant to Jesus than temporal change. See, Jesus knows where he came from. He knows where we're going. He knows what it's going to be like when we get there. That is so much more important than this mess that we're living in today that we're wading through. Now, why the signs and the wonders and the miracles of Messiah? To get the people's attention and to prove that he was the genuine Messiah. There were many phonies in his day saying that they were the Messiah, but Jesus is the only one that fulfilled the miracles that were required of Messiah. Now, some closing thoughts. Some closing thoughts. Please know this. God is an expert at entering into impossible situations. We must process that. We must understand that. Jeremiah 32, 27 says it perfectly. I am the Lord. I love this. I am. I am. Remember in John chapter 8 when he's talking to the Pharisees, I am the eagle, am I? I am God, the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Question mark. And we should say, no, no, God, there's nothing too hard for you, nothing too difficult for you. You know, we serve a God that can tear down strongholds. We, can, we, can serve, we serve a God that can heal anything, tear down any stronghold. Remember those long-term ways that we've done life where, where Satan has a foothold of anger and jealousy and greed and all the things that we do as humans. Those things can be torn down. The walls can tear down. When we, when we see our own problems, oftentimes we think, this is impossible. I don't know how God's going to work this one out. And then we see other people's problems with dwarf our problems, and we go, well, that's certainly impossible. And then we look at our world that is changing at breakneck speed, and we say, this is impossible. This isn't getting better. Folks, this world is not getting better. It is devolving, not evolving. Jesus is coming back to rescue us. The church isn't going to make it great enough for Jesus to come back and get everything in order. That is a false teaching. That's a new apostolic reformation. That is not the proper teaching. And when you see problems that are too big for you, think this. God, is anything too hard for me? When you see a problem, think faith. When you think faith, think of God. When you think of God, think God can do the impossible. When you think of God of the impossible, remember God is your strength through it. The thing might not change, but God is your strength through it. And when God is your strength, folks, you can endure anything. It's temporary. What did Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4? Verse of da 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 That wasn't tongues. That was just <laughs> our light and momentary. He says, though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. 
For our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. See, Paul had a perspective that all of the beatings, all the stuff he went through was light and momentary. When God can give you that outlook, that is a miracle. He's entered into your situation. Our faith in God places us in miracle country. Faith moves the heart of God. During our faith testing time, I must realize a couple of truths. Faith does guarantee something, that God is in the boat with me. He is in the storm with me. He is in the turmoil with me. Does it mean everything's going to get smooth instantly? No, but he is in it with me. And you must realize you are not alone. You are not alone. Our God will go through whatever your fire is with you. He takes you by the hand. He doesn't say you can leap over it, crawl under it, run around it. He says, I will take you through the fire, through the fire. These two verses have helped me in my life. They probably have helped you too. Romans 8, 28. Look at, this is a great verse. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, whenever I give a teaching on this, I always preface it with, it doesn't mean everything's good. A rape of a child is not good. A murder is not good. Somebody stealing all your life savings is not good. But I know that I know that I know that this verse is true, that somehow, some way, which I may never see, God will work out some good in this thing. I have to believe that. I, it helps me. I gain strength from that when I don't understand. And then Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2 and 3a says this, when you pass through the waters, this is talking about the tumults of your life, I will be with you. The presence of God is the most important thing that you have in your life when you're going through things that you do not understand or things that seem like they're never, ever, ever going to end. I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, the intensification of the situation, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I will be with you through this whole thing. Again, it might not all straighten out here. One day it will. The true believers has something that the world does not have. And they don't understand us. Folks, we have hope. We have hope through any situation. We have the hope that God can change it in a second. And we have the hope that he is with us to give us the strength if he's not going to change it. That's what we have. The hope that one of these days, this will all be over and we'll all be home. That's the hope that we have. When we think of heaven, when you think of heaven, oftentimes we think in abstract terms. It's ethereal. It's some fate, fate, uh, fuzzy, fady thing. It's too perfect. It's too unreal. It's make-believe. It's make-believe. Folks, I want to tell you something from the bottom of my heart. Heaven is real. It's more real than anything that you can imagine. I have seen and I have been with people dying. And I have, and I have heard of in children's hospital, children and these people that I've seen dying, several of them, where they have seen the other side before they go over. And they start looking and seeing, they get this thing in their eyes, the kids in particular. And they're saying, what are you looking at, Johnny? What are you looking at, Sally? And they describe an angelic type figure. You know, we're transported from here by the angels. Folks, it's real. Heaven is real. More than anything you can imagine. Now, when you get to heaven, I've heard this argument. People talking about living forever. And how it will become, well, if I live billions and billions and billions of years, it's going to get so boring, I can't believe it. I don't want to live forever. I just want to end it. A lot of atheists have that argument. Folks, that's a phony argument. Because in heaven, our senses will be enhanced. We're not going there like this. God can't communicate like this. I mean, we're going to be in his presence. You've got to be kidding me. We've got to be, we've got to be going to a different level. Different level. Our senses will be enhanced. Our knowledge enlarged. Our future will be amazing. We will be changed. In 1 John 3, 2, we will be like him. Folks, then we'll be able to understand 
all the physics questions, the chemistry questions, how all this thing works, you're going to go, wow, God, forever and eternity. Think about this. A, an eternity of new discoveries, an eternity of exploring the depths of God. Go to the Creation Museum. Get in that little thing that I always fall asleep in, that planetarium, and they're expanding. I never get past like the second sun or something, but Anyway, it's so vast and so huge and so amazing. One of these days we're going to be there, and we'll understand it. We'll understand it. It won't be some foggy thing in our minds. The infinite God, the depths of God, forever learning, forever growing, forever surprised by God, forever content. Can you imagine? Content, forever at peace, forever enjoying God forever being fulfilled, feeling whole and complete. That is what heaven is going to be. And folks, the guy wrote the song, and the movie was written about it. I can only imagine. I, when I stand in your presence, you can't read this, but I'll read it for you. When I stand in your presence, to my knees I will fall. Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? Oh, folks, I can only imagine. Heaven is real. This is temporal. And all I can say is, yea, God. Yea, God. So until then, okay, we're, we're here. We're here now. Until we're there, in the, we're here in this inferior state, by the way. See, progressives like to think we're progressing to a higher level of development. I'm sorry. Look around you at the moral condition of humanity. We are in a free fall. This isn't just a, we're not just gliding down with our parachutes. We are in a free fall of decadence, a free fall. And now we have this thing with the World Health Organization want to take control of our health. We're giving up sovereignty, national sovereignty to a world. Folks, this is going towards globalism. Look, things are a mess here. When, when I say when we're in this inferior state, we are in an inferior state here. We have to be changed. Until then, folks, we walk by faith and not by sight. I will trust my God no matter what. The righteous will live by faith. Impossible, you say? No way. For the believer, that is our life. That is our lifeline. Folks, with God, with God, all things are possible. Say that with me. With God, all things. All things are possible. Yes, yes, no matter what, how things turn out, how they turn out, God is with you in the chaos, in the turmoil. We can rest in that, knowing that this too shall end one day. Sila, pause and ponder. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the encouragement of it. Lord, I thank you that you do enter into situations. Lord, there are some times that you just choose to heal a paralytic, to heal a blind man, to heal the nobleman's son, that you, you just choose to, 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 to raise the dead. And oftentimes that doesn't happen. We have to be honest. But we do believe that we believe that you enter into our situations and you give us uncommon strength uncommon perseverance, uncommon encouragement that we will make it through to the end and one of these days we'll be with you and we will be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, things will be different. But until then, may we hold on tightly to our Lord, our Kurios, our master, our ruler, our owner. In Jesus' name, amen.